Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Pleasant good morning to all of you this morning. I greet you all in no other name but the precious name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you happy to be in church this morning? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Shall we all stand in, in the house of the Lord? Amen. This morning we come to worship the Lord. Amen. Are you ready to praise him? Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible said, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with sadness. Amen. With sadness, right? Gladness, all right? So we're going to be happy. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. This morning, I ask Sister Nisha to open us in prayer. Hallelujah. Will you all bow your heads with me this morning? Hallelujah. As we reverence God this morning. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning, Father. We exalt your name this morning, God. A name which is above every other name this morning, God. A name at which every knee shall bow and every tongue one day will confess that you are Lord. We give you thanks this morning, God. We give you thanks that we could be here in your presence this morning, God to give you glory and to give you honor and to give you what you deserve this morning God I pray that our praises this morning Father God will go as a sweet smelling savor unto you Jesus I pray that you will take it all God you will take all that we have oh God this morning Jesus we give it all to you God you run the service God for your honor and for your glory Lord every moment of it God every second of it Jesus I pray God that your name will be glorified God you go before us in the service today God in your mighty name I pray Jesus amen hallelujah amen hallelujah so this morning as we ready to begin to give God praise I just want you to reach out with all your heart your body your soul and your spirit. Amen. You ready this morning? Amen. Amen. Just a few. Amen. Hallelujah. We bless the name of Jesus. Joy to
Christ the Lord is your strength. Amen. Hallelujah. We bless the name of Jesus this morning. Amen. We give you worship. We give you praise this morning. For your name is wonderful counselor. Mighty God. The everlasting father. The prince of peace. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. When you have no peace in your life, Amen. you can count on Jesus. Amen. Amen. He is the Prince of Peace. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I find we so quiet this morning. Amen. Is that? Holy mood, better Bob say, but you can make a joyful noise, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. You're right. Come on, clap your hands, yeah. and you can dance too. Get up, get up. 
Amen. Amen. We give him praise. We give him thanks. Amen. Oh, Hallelujah. Thank you. thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated for a moment as we give these singers' voices a rest. Amen. So this time I'm going to call him pastor. Amen. He has some announcement to make this morning. Praise the Lord. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord? Yes. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a big clap. Hallelujah. Well, we are in December month. The year is almost over. And we thank God for his goodness, his love, his mercy to each and every one of us here in the sanctuary as well as those that have been viewing online. Amen. Our faithful viewers who have been tuned in week after week. May God richly bless you. 
Uh, may God answer your every prayers. Praise the name of the Lord. We are Word of Faith Gospel Tabernacle, Web Street, Williamville, Trinidad, West Indies. Amen. A church in the heart of Williamville with a heart for Williamsville. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. So, we have some announcements. Well, the regular announcements, we'll be back here again Wednesday evening, 7 p.m. Friday evening, 7 p.m. Amen. And uh, next week, Sunday, we will be back again in the house of the Lord at 9 a.m. Remember, um, Christmas falls on a Monday, and uh, you will not be getting this Sunday off. We will be having service Sunday. Amen. And then you coming back Monday, which is Christmas Day, at 8 a.m. But we are mindful. We would not have long service Sunday and so on. And after Christmas, we go on a little break, you know, from the Wednesday and the Friday. Because you still have things, you know, to do. Maybe use your time to connect with family and friends. So you will be updated with regards to those announcements. Amen. On the 16th, remember the 16th, Saturday the 16th of December, 4 p.m. will be our concert, so feel free to invite your friends and relatives, neighbors. And on uh, Sunday the 17th of December, 4 p.m. would be our church dinner. Amen. So, really for the church, for those of you that have been here, you have been with us, amen, and I say the church sponsors everything for that. During today's service, Sister Paula will be meeting with all the children downstairs to prepare for the Christmas concert. So, so Paula, you will know the time to, um, to identify the children and take them downstairs. You will know your time. This evening at 4 p.m. will be the Christmas Nativity skit practice. All right, and it resumed. They have been working hard, you know, week after week. So those taking part are reminded to attend. All right, the nativity skit practice. Christmas concert. I mentioned that the dinner, the seventeenth. I mentioned about Christmas morning service, the twenty-fifth Monday at eight a.m. But the Sunday before that, normal 9 a.m. All year's night service, 9 p.m. So please prepare yourself. And you know what we do all year's night? We identify, well, we identify a project and we ask you to, to sow towards it. We have a box, a prayer, a prayer box that you put your prayer request. And from there on, we start praying. Then in the new year, we go into our week of prayer and fast. And it's a week dedicated to praying and fasting. And you put your prayer request in the box. And um, we lift it up every time we meet that God would answer your prayers. Amen. So you know how we do it. And God has been answering prayers. Amen. I wouldn't ask you to come up. But for this year, 2023, some of you may have put your prayer request in the box. Have you had an answer for that in 2023? Just put up your hand. Amen. So we see some hands up. Amen. So we thank God for that. And we continue. So we give you the opportunity to sow a seed towards a project. Um, as you see, every year we do something to enhance the house of the Lord. This year we did the roof. Amen. Last year we did a lot of work at the back and work is still continuing. But the Chandu assisted us um, this week with the ceiling. We had a terrible end there and it wasn't looking really nice. And Brother Chandu did that for us. He came and gave his time, give him a big round of applause for that. As you notice, some of you might be maybe seated in some newly covered. Um, chairs and that work is ongoing and uh, Jivan he has the skills and he's assisting with that Amen. 
many of us who have various skills, you have been doing your, your, your part to enhance the house of the Lord. And give yourself a big round of applause. So we give you the opportunity to give towards projects that we, we have in the new year. Amen. Yesterday was the birthday of a very special lady in our midst. And that is Sister Gail Sinat. Her birthday was yesterday. Gail, stand up. Let's give you a big round of applause. Praise the name of the Lord. Whenever she comes, she's here very early, almost before everybody. And she, you know, she's here, you know, to give God praise, honor, and glory. So, may God continue to bless each and every one of you in what you do for God and in your life, your personal life, your family life, whatever challenges you have, whatever situation you confront, that God will see you through. God will see you through. I know during this year, some, of, some people had challenges. I know Brother Peter had his challenges with health and so on. This morning he was sharing his testimony. And God has seen him through and continue to see him through. So Brother Peter, stand up. Amen. Let everybody see you. I up and around. Amen. Because it was a serious surgery he had. Amen. Heart surgery. It was a serious situation. But God saw him true. And we thank God that he's here with us. And I want you to be reminded that every day, almost every day, I pray for each and every one of you. I may not have the time to call name by name, but I pray for all the members of this assembly. I pray for you and your families. I pray for safe traveling mercies on the highways and byways. I pray for God's continued guidance, direction, and protection for you. So, my wife knows that because when I pray, she's right there at my side. And, you know, I lift you up in prayer that God will take care of you, provide for you, make a way for you. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. So, those are all the announcements. Today, we will be giving out two certificates. Last week, we had what a baptism. Kezia and her sister Kenesha. Amen. So that will fit in the right time in, in the service. Okay. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Over to the worship team. Amen. Praise the Lord. Shall we all stand in the house of the Lord? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to urge you to give your all to Jesus. Amen. Worship Him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Don't say in that grave anymore. But as the song says, get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Whatever grave you are in, it's time to get alive. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because God wants to move. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So just reach out. Forget the person next to you. Hallelujah. You just poured your soul to the Lord.
voices. There is no
morning we also want to remember brother Christy Foy in our prayer and his fiance you know she have lost her pastor amen and we want to remember them in prayer we pray that God will strengthen her and brother Christy Foy and the entire ministry and the Abraham family this morning amen we pray that the blessing of the Lord will be upon the life amen that God will comfort and strengthen them at this time of loss Amen. Hallelujah. But the, the Bible said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. So we want you all to be encouraged in the Abraham family, um, Brother Christopher. Amen. That we have been praying for you. Amen. In our own private prayer. Amen. That God will bless and strengthen and keep you. Amen. And your fiancé. Amen. Praise the Lord. So come on as we put our hands together for Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And by extension, those of you who have lost loved one, we want to know, be strong in the Lord. If my sister Sandra Dean has lost her uncle and other relative. You know, this is life. We all have to go through this. But as you know, they say we do not get accustomed to it. And sometimes we do not prepare for it. But that is something we have to prepare for. Amen. Sometimes we don't like to talk about it or anything. But one day, we will have to face it. Amen. Amen. The Bible, the Ecclesiastes say a time, to be, a time to be born and a time to die. Amen. Hallelujah. So God has that time set for each and every one of us. Praise the Lord. So you may be seated in the house of the Lord as I hand right over to Pastor this morning. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. What a wonderful time of praise and worship and prayer. Amen. As I said, we are in the Christmas season and we'll be doing a series of of Christmas messages as we build up to Christmas service. Amen. And to start the ball rolling we have this morning the head of the men's department, none other than Brother Wayne, a very hard worker in the church. Amen. And is growing up, you know. He grew up in the house of the Lord, amen, from very small. And he knows the word of God. He knows the things of God. Amen. So without further delay, I call on Brother Wayne. And he's going to share God's word with us. Give him a big round of applause. Good morning, everybody. Brother Christopher, I didn't know about your fiancé's pastor. Please accept my condolences. Now, I, I, I've, I've met Brother Christopher's fiancé on, on one occasion. Well, two occasions. On one occasion, I, I've listened to him preach. And he strikes me as a no-nonsense, no-compromise kind of guy. And we need more like that in the church. It's kind of hard to hear that just before I come and preach. That means a Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. December is here. It's a time when people, well, in my house, I have no choice. I have to be happy because it's December month, it's Christmas month. So I want to wish everybody, while I have the opportunity here, a Merry Christmas. I want to say thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity to share today. And I want to thank my wife for encouraging me to stick with this and uh, 
complete a message for today. God and how alone was there a time I really wanted to call Pastor this week and say, Pastor, can I make? Um, I've spent probably over 48 hours research, fact checking, double fact checking, prayer time, preparing for the sermon. Don't worry, I'm going to get all of it today. <laughs> Otherwise, Kezia would get she certificate tomorrow. So I just pull out a couple things that I want to talk about today. Um, as Pastor say, we are in the Christmas season, and today we begin a series that would lead up to the birth of Christ. And I was asked this year, same as last year, to begin this series. And I'm going to be using a scripture from Genesis chapter 3 as my foundation scripture. So for, for my introduction, let me just talk a little bit about what is happening in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, um, the wife of Adam is deceived by the devil, not yet named Eve. She hasn't gotten her, her name yet until about verse 20. So at the beginning of Genesis chapter 3, Adam is already created in chapter 2. Eve is already created. And uh, the serpent approaches Eve in the Garden of Eden. The devil approaches Eve in the form of a serpent, I should probably say, in the garden. And he deceives her. And we know that this serpent is the devil because Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 refers to him as that old serpent eh, called the devil and Satan who deceived the world. So we're not talking about a serpent, we're talking about the devil in the form of a serpent. L let me draw the line over there right now. So when I say serpent, I'm speaking about the devil here. So the devil deceives Eve and Eve now eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil which God had told them not to eat from and not to touch and after Eve ate Eve gave unto her husband and he ate also so both were disobedient to God and as a result of this what follows are four curses a curse upon the serpent or the actual serpent, the snake himself, following himself to be used by the devil. A curse upon the devil, a curse upon the woman, and a curse upon the ground for the sake of man. But among these four curses, there also stands out a, a prophecy. The very first in the Bible. Something so so momentous, something so radical for so early in the Bible, something so noteworthy that it even has its own name. And we find this prophecy in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, which is called the Proto-Evangelium of the Bible. Proto, a Greek word meaning first evangelium, Greek word meaning good news or gospel. So what was happening here is that the first good news in the Bible. And that's the first thing I wanted to take away from this. In the midst of all your curses, in the midst of all your problems, in the midst of everything that is against you, there is good news. In the very act of cursing man, woman, serpent, the devil, for the first time in the Bible, God also gives good news. And I want to focus a little bit on this good news today in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 where it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Today the title of my sermon is the seed of the woman, and I want to show you how applicable this is in starting a series of a, that would lead up to a Christmas sermon or the birth of Jesus Christ. Because this is where everything starts. 
Okay, the seed of the woman. Let's just bow our heads and pray. Almighty God, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come into your house today. And I pray that your Holy Spirit, oh God, would uh, give unto us exactly what we need from your word to understand today. And I pray, my God, that Father, you will help us to understand how to apply it back into our lives, that this word could be a blessing unto us. Let your Holy Spirit speak to each and every one of us. And speak through me to touch your people. These are your words, O oh God. Anointed and sanctified by you. They are not mine. And I thank you for sharing with me that I could share with your people today. And let your Holy Spirit share with me even as I share with them. In Jesus' name, Amen. So the first thing I want us to understand, I'm, I'm going to, as I say, I'm going to be focusing. Let me focus a little bit on one scripture. We have communion today. We have the presentation of certificates today. I'm not going to lie and say I'm going to be short. Anytime I say that, I'm supposed to know I'm lying. It has never happened. But I'm going to try to be mindful of what we have to do today. So let's just get a, a couple things clear. Uh, I'm going to focus on one scripture. I'm going to use a couple backup scriptures. For the sake of time, I'll read most of them instead of giving you the time to um, find them. For the sake of time, I'll probably pull what is applicable to the sermon from certain scriptures instead of reading the whole scripture. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. There are two things over here. There is a curse and there are prophecies. What's the difference? A curse is instantaneous. And prophecies speaks of something to come. It's a prediction of something to come. So when God curses his serpent, it happens immediately. Immediately, the serpent loses feet, wings, whatever he has, and he begins to crawl, and dust be becomes his food. When God curses the devil, that curse is instantaneous. He curses woman. She had no children yet, but that curse is instantaneous. It happens one time. He curses the ground immediately. Tones and tissues starts growing up. Curses. Prophecy can either be a blessing or a curse, but it happens sometime in the future. Okay. Curses, prophecy. So I just want to divide Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, into the four parts. It really comes together as, and explain what is happening over here. So the very first part of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Now this is the only curse. This is the only curse here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I want us to understand that. It's not the only curse against the devil, but it's the only curse here. The others are prophecies. So what, what really is God saying in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when he says, I will put enmity between the and the woman. Now this is something instantaneous. So what is going to happen here is God is saying now, I am going to put enmity between you and the woman. So immediately, hate begins to exist. Now at no time before in the Bible we hear Satan, in the form of any animal, or as himself, speaking to Adam or Eve. This, Satan approached Eve in the form of a serpent and they were having a conversation. Like everything was okay. It's a normal day. I just talk into a serpent. And that's how it was in the garden with Eve and Satan at this time. So they would have a normal conversation. And God is saying, now I am going to put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman. So I am going to drive a wedge between you and the woman, I'm going to put hostility and hatred between you and the woman. And this was very important. I'll tell you why it was important. This is important because Eve is supposed to become the mother of all living. Genesis chapter 
3 verse 20 says, And Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all living. Imagine if Eve and the serpent or Satan were friends and they continued talking. Just imagine for a moment the influence the sat this Satan, this devil could have on her and thereby affect her children. We are friends. We are friends. And we have, a, we have a famous, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. Why is that? Because our friends influence us. You lie around people who are forward thinking, positive people, and you would begin to think positive. You would find yourself in positive actions. You surround yourself with people who like to smoke and drink and lime and, and do all kind of craziness. You'll find yourself doing the same thing. So if Eve was to continue having conversations and interactions with this devil, what do you think would happen? The possibility exists she would start to behave like that and her children could easily follow in her footsteps. So the very first thing the devil do, sorry, God does, is he says, Satan, I'm putting enmity, I'm putting hatred between you and a woman. I'm going to separate all you. She's no longer going to want to talk to you. She's not going to like you. And it's going to be the same with you and her. So he separates them. He puts enmity between them. The very next thing that happens over here is a prophecy. The scripture goes on to say, and between thy seed and her seed. So the same enmity that exists between Satan and the woman is now going to exist between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Now, the woman does not yet have seed. She doesn't have children. And that is how we know this is a prophecy. She doesn't have children yet, so they can't hate the seed of the serpent yet. But the devil has seeds in two ways. Evil spirits, demons, all his underlings, principalities, powers, they are considered seeds of Satan, seeds of the serpent. People like you and I, who decide to follow Satan by doing what he wants, by not pleasing God, they too are considered the seed of the serpent. That is why Jesus Christ referred to the, the Pharisees as seeds of the devil. He said, you are of your father the devil. You are of your father the devil. So people like you and I can also become seeds of the serpent. So seeds of the serpent already existed because they were already fallen angels. He had seed already, but Eve didn't have seed. And Eve's seed, the seed of the woman... God says, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and her seed. And today we see that happening. When you start coming to church, everybody will be happy for you. Everybody won't be happy. You start serving God, you're going to lose friends. I promise you, you go around, you, you now get saved, you're excited. Jesus Christ is your first love and you go around telling all your friends about Jesus and witnessing to them, inviting them to church. They will say, yeah, 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 I go come. Yeah, yeah, one day I go come. And then after about a week, two weeks, they start hiding from you. Because every time you come, you want to talk about Jesus. About how he saved you, about how he deliver you. How he saved you. They're not interested in that. They stop taking your calls. You reach up in front of the house because they're not taking your calls. Say, so you're going to check them because the love of Jesus Christ is inside of you and you're worried about them. So reach by the house. Come knocking on the door and the children come outside. Daddy say here at home. Because they may want to talk to you. You go on the job. They're calling you. You get saved. He's pastor. Everybody. You now get saved as a pastor in work. That's the pastor here. Pastor. It doesn't matter who you are. The world will hate you because they don't understand you. They will hate you because they don't understand you. As Christians, we are not supposed to commit sin. When we commit sin, we move from being a child of God to becoming a child of the devil. 
And this is what separates us. The Bible in John chapter 8 verse 34 says, Whosoever committed sin is a servant of sin. It says whosoever commits sin is a servant of sin. So think about it. We commit sin. We become a servant of sin. And no servant can serve two masters. Matthew chapter 6 24 says, no man can serve two masters. Either he would love one and hate the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So God is saying here that I'm going to put enmity between your seed, Satan, and her seed. And they can't serve you and me at the same time. You're going to love one and you're going to hate the other. As much as you might try, we might try to keep one foot in and one foot out to make we friends happy, but we can't do it. That's the second thing. The next two prophecies speaks directly about Jesus, and I want to spend more time on, on this, if you would permit me. The third part here says, It shall bruise thy head. Speaking about the seed of the woman again. We have two parts of this remaining. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. I want you to ask yourself a little bit, which song is a little more serious? A bruise head or a bruise heel? I bruise that song more, uh, more serious, and I mean, let's say you take off your foot, com you take off your foot completely, you're gonna still live. You're gonna live if they take off your head completely. A bruise head is more dangerous, it's more severe. It might be life threatening, but it's more severe. As opposed to if you bounce a heel, you bruise your heel. It's not that severe. That would be something minor. Foot might hurt a couple of days, but you'll get over it. So the third part of the prophecy says, and this is where we begin speaking about Jesus, it says, out of the seed of the woman, one is going to come that is going to bruise your head. Now I want us to guess, get something clear over here. This is not the final blow against the devil. That, it, that is yet to come in judgment. Day. That's all the way back there in Revelation. When we talk about the bruising of the head here, we're talking about something that is severe, but not something that is fatal. It's something dangerous, but it's not something final. Because the devil still has to face his final judgment after the coming of Christ. Christ comes, he performs a work on the cross, but that's not the end of it for the devil. He still has to wait his final judgment. So when we say that it shall bruise our head here, we're not talking about something final yet. We say that he is going to deal you a severe blow. And that blow is redemption. Amen. What is redemption? Redemption is the act of Jesus Christ saving us from our sin. Redemption is Jesus Christ giving up his life, paying a price to redeem us back unto God. See, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sinned. They would walk with God and they would talk with God in the evening. And then sin came and separated man from God. Because now men were of their father, the devil. But Jesus Christ was now coming at a day and at a time when he was going to redeem man back to his father. And this is exactly what God is saying over here. Jesus Christ is going to come. The seed of the woman is going to come and he's going to hit your head blue because now you would no longer have the authority to hold my children captive you would no longer have the authority to hold my people in sin if they should so choose they could now come back to me you know how devastating that was to the devil because now you and I could go to God the Father at any time at any time and let's ask him to forgive us our sins and we become redeemed. That's why the Bible says you will not redeem with corruptible things such as gold and silver, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. What is that speaking to? We had a nice conversation, I think it was on the last occasion we had men meeting. We had a nice discussion on redemption itself. And we learned a little bit about redemption taking place on the cross 
and so too now everyone beyond that is redeemed. You see, what would happen before this is the, the firstborn, the firstborn in every household had to, everybody know that the firstborn was entitled to a double portion. So you had three children, you split it up in three, two portions go to the firstborn, one to the second. You had 12 sons, you divide it in 13. Two portions to the first son, the other get one portion each. And that's just how it was. We like to hear about that. Getting things. But when we, when we talk about redemption over here, as not being redeemed with corruptible things such as gold and silver, what would actually happen back then? Is the firstborn belong to God. And in terms of people, what would happen is when you had a firstborn son, you would take him to the temple and give him to the Lord. That's the custom. You would give him to the Lord. But you wouldn't just give him to the Lord. You had the option to redeem him back onto yourself. By paying for him with gold or silver. So before Jesus came, man would redeem his son with something corruptible, gold and silver. It was a small cost. It wasn't anything major. But after Jesus come now, we are no longer redeemed by, by corruptible things, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ came and he bruised the devil's head by purchasing redemption for us. And how did this happen? I just want to look at one scripture over here. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. Well, two scriptures actually. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. And then I'll look at Galatians chapter 4 verse 5. I'm going to just read it for the sake of time. And I want you to understand what God has redeemed us from. And what God has redeemed us to. It's important that we understand where we were and where we are. A lot of people know that they were in sin and they were in iniquity, but they don't know who they are in Christ yet. I want you to know where you were and who you are now in Christ. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 says, Christ had redeemed us from the curse of the law. The curse of the law. So you were redeemed from the curse of the law. The curse of the law is sin. Adam and Eve, let me stop over there with it. Adam and Eve were in the garden. They didn't know right from wrong. They didn't know right from wrong. The Bible says, up until the time of Adam and Eve, sin was in the world, but it was not imputed unto man. So man could sin, but because the law didn't exist, sin couldn't exist. Sin only exists when law begins to exist. If there is no law saying thou shalt not kill, then you haven't broken any law by killing somebody. If there is no law saying thou shalt not steal, then you haven't broken any laws by stealing something. So before Adam and Eve walked with God in grace, and anything they did that was wrong was not counted as sin against them. But the moment Adam and Eve sinned, what did they eat from? The tree of knowledge. They had knowledge now of good and evil. So they knew what was right and what was wrong. Before this, they didn't know. So God couldn't hold it against them. You just didn't know. But now they knew what was good. And they knew what was evil. They knew the law. So it says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, which is sin, which Adam and Eve fell to, being made a curse for us. So he redeemed us from the curse for himself. I'm moving out to Galatians chapter 4 verse 5. And this is what he redeemed us to. To redeem that, them that were under the law, that they might receive the adoption of sons. So he didn't just redeem you from the curse of law. He redeemed you to, see the very first word in the scripture over there? And last word, the adoption of sons. From the curse of law, to 
through the adoption of sons. So no longer are you walking in sin and in laws of the sin, but now you walk when you have become redeemed as sons of God. And as sons of God, you have right, the right to certain things as a son of God. Romans chapter 8 verse 2 similarly tells us, For the law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ had made me free from the law of sin and death. Similarly, the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life. So man was dead after the, sin, the sins that Adam and Eve committed. But now, the law of the Spirit had made us free in Jesus Christ. Redemption. It shall bruise thy head. Jesus Christ bruised the devil's head by putting sin up. Redemption for us. He paid a price, his life, so that you and I could be redeemed. Price paid, man redeemed. Price paid, man redeemed. Last prophecy here, and it's minor. And thou shalt bruise his heel. As I said before, a bruise heel is something minor. And this prophecy actually refers to the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. I want you to understand the pain and suffering that Jesus Christ endured on the cross was great. It wasn't minor. Please understand that. It was agonizing. It was hard. But it was nothing compared to what was to be gained from it. It was hurtful. It was hard. It was so hard that he even asked his father, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. We know it was difficult. But despite all that, he faced up to it because he knew what was to be gained from it. It might sound to us sometimes as, as if the Bible is saying, Thou shalt bruise his heel. It sounds as if the, the devil is actually going to do something to God. And it sounds as if, the, as small as it is, it's a small victory for God. But I want you to, for the devil, sorry. But I want you to understand that this was no victory for Satan. This was an allowance by God. When God has his hands upon you, just as with Job, the devil can't touch you. And God had his hand upon his son. The devil was only allowed to influence Job's body and Job's livestock and Job's family. Because God allowed him to. So the devil had no victory here. This is something that God simply allowed you know how hard it is for a father to allow people to crucify his son? Yet still God did. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 10 it said, Yet it pleased the Lord. God wasn't happy with it. The word used here is pleased, but really and truly, as God weighed the options, leave man in sin, or allow my son for him. And he realized that one was more pleasing than the other. It pleased God to redeem us. It pleased God to bring us back to him. Despite the cause of his son. So yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper his hand. God allowed it. Despite everything. Weighing the options. Knowing us to be his seed also. He allowed it. So you and I could be redeemed back unto God. Thou shall bruise his heel. Not a victory. An allowance by God that Jesus Christ could die on the cross. One curse, three prophecies in one verse. I'm not answering something. Just want to touch on one, probably one more thing over here before we close. Why refer to Jesus Christ as a seed? 
And this is important. Really and truly, this is where the message uh, would in, impact and affect us. Why refer to Jesus as a seed? Let's look at four things. First of all, it's something that Adam and Eve could understand. You couldn't refer to Jesus Christ as a weapon. They didn't have that. It was just two of them who they needed to defend themselves against. Neither a vehicle. That's something we could understand now. They could understand a seed. They had trees all around them. They know about sowing and reaping and, uh, and naming animals. This is something they knew about. So God used something, just like in all the other parables, he used something that they could understand. And that's why he chose to use a seed. It's something the devil couldn't understand too. So it's something Adam and Eve could understand. They could understand how a seed does work. The nature of a seed. About planting a seed. Going into the ground and coming up. It's something the devil couldn't understand. When you read Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. As it is. If you read Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 3 all the way up to verse 15. You have no idea what is going to happen. In the gospels when Jesus Christ was crucified. It doesn't tell you that. Now as the months. Sorry as the weeks come along. We'll hear about different prophecies. Coming from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. All the way up. The Old Testament. From those who would share after me. As to how God would point to Jesus Christ. Being crucified. Coming, being born in a manger. In the fullness of time. And being crucified. But when you speak about him as a seed, back in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, the devil can't understand that. He, he, there's not enough information there for him to understand what is about to happen. And if he can't understand what is going to happen, point three, he can't try to stop it. So God doesn't want the devil to interfere with his plan. So he makes it in such a way that he can't understand it. Now in the fullness of time, whether the devil wanted to or not, Jesus Christ was going to be born. He had no control over that. But he wouldn't jail people to have Christ crucified on a cross. Had he known that that cross, those nails on that cross would be the nail in his own coffin. Because he had been trying to from the very beginning to kill the seed of the woman not knowing what happened. Why? Cain killed Abel. Who Abel was? Abel was the seed of the woman. And if the devil understood that Jesus Christ is the seed that he was talking about, Abel might have been living. From the very beginning, enmity existed between man and woman and between man's seed being Abel, and the devil's seed being Cain. And they were against each other. That's why later on in somewhere about Genesis chapter 5, he said that God had given her another seed in place of Abel. He had given her another seed. From the very beginning, the devil had been trying to kill the seed of the woman. And so God made it in such a way that he couldn't understand so he couldn't try to stop it. Number four. Just as a seed, Jesus would do three things. He would take time to come. He would die. And he would bring forth fruit. He would take time to come. He would die. And he would bring forth fruit. Let's look at one verse. Two. Galatians chapter four. Verse four to five. And we're talking about Jesus over here. It says here, but when the fullness of time was come, took time to come, God sent his son, made of a woman, seed of a woman, made under the law, flesh and blood, like you and I, to redeem, purchased by the debt, he would die. So we're talking about he would die over here. Then that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons bring forth fruits so look at three things here when the fullness of time was come it took time for Jesus to come 
He came to redeem. That means that Jesus Christ would die. Pay for us with his life. To make us sons by the adoptions of sons. He would bring forth fruits. So Jesus Christ took his time to come. Then he died. And now we today, you and I, are his sons. Because he has now adopted us into his kingdom. So Jesus Christ came as a seed. So that you and I could be redeemed and be sons. What does this mean for you and I today? What does this mean for you and I? Jesus Christ came in the fullness of time. People were expecting him long before. He came and he died. And he went into the ground just as a seed. And in his resurrection, he brought forth fruits, you and I. But are we just supposed to be sons? Living in the adoption of sons? John chapter 15 verse 16 says, You have not chosen me. I have chosen you. I understand this. I have ordained you. That you now should go and bring forth fruit. So Jesus has brought forth fruit. You and I sitting here. We are the fruit of Jesus Christ. And now he has chosen you. You didn't choose him. You're not here because you choose him. He chose that you should be saved in the fullness of time. In the right time. He saved you. He delivered you from your sin. He cleaned you up. And he has ordained you that you now, being saved and redeemed, should go forth and bring forth fruit. And this is why the Bible says we are supposed to live as Christ. So now you and I are supposed to go forth and bring forth fruit Amen. and that your fruit should remain train them up nurture them up teach them and keep them in the house of God and then it says yeah, and whatsoever you ask of my name in, ask the father in my name he may give it to you and we, we, we like that part of the scripture that he might give it to us you see, Jesus Christ came as a seed of the woman, redeemed you as his fruit, so that you could go forth and bring fruit. And yeah, we want to be fruitful. And we like the second part of the scripture. The scripture. We want that we might receive what the Father has for us. But are you willing to die? And this is really important to us as, as Christians, eh? Uh, let me close with this. This is really important to us. Are you willing to die? As a Christian, are you willing to die? Bible says, except a grain of wheat goes into the ground and die, it cannot bring forth fruit we like the idea of coming into the house of God and learning about Jesus Christ and growing doing things in the house of God and our lives changing but we don't like the idea of dying we like to come into the house of God and hold on to our pride and our bitterness and our hatred and everything that we had before. We want to hold on to it. Probably hide it up and cover it and, and shade it a little bit so people don't see it. But we want to keep it. Nobody wants to die to self. Nobody wants to die to pride. Nobody wants to die to the bitterness. Nobody wants to die to the hatred. 
But we have people in church who don't talk to one another. Maybe not here. Not here. Because everybody does talk to everybody over here. Everybody knows sister, who Sister Gail was this morning, eh? <laughs> yes, I know Sister Gail, but everybody knows Sister Gail. I sure when pastor talk about Chandu doing some work, I decide over there and Chandu assists with the flashing in front of you and thing, the molding in front of you and thing. Somebody asks him and I say, who is Chandu? Let me be honest, that's because all of us in our own little bubble. We're in our own little bubble. We care about nobody else. Let me say it as it is. We care about nobody else at the end of the day. Christmas coming and we sell in our house, our curtains, the ham. We paint, we decorate, we study everything about ourselves. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas, everybody. We really don't care about anything else. We come in church, dress up nice, we look nice, we tell everybody Merry Christmas, we give them a little gift. Some of us, we study and ask them and have you, just tell everybody. Pastor, make an announcement about Christmas Eve service this Sunday before Christmas. Ask them, you're coming? <laughs> How many of you ask yourself that question already? Except you as a grain of wheat. Like Jesus Christ growing to the, going to the ground and die. Die! Let me tell you how a Christian is supposed to live. Eh? It's not supposed to be you. It's supposed to be Christ living through you. Paul got it right. Let me, let me read one more scripture and I'll close with that. In Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, it tells us here Paul get it right. Paul says here, I am crucified with Christ. What are you supposed to be? Crucified with Christ. That means you're dead. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you understand what that verse is saying? Paul is saying, hey, I don't really live anymore. Now. It's Christ who really lives through me. He gave himself for me and now he lives through me. Everything I do and, and the way I live, everything is about Christ. I have now died. You want to bring fruit and for your fruit to remain, you must die first. We like the idea of asking the Father of anything and He giving unto us. But for that to happen, you must die first. This morning I wanted to ask yourself a question. Are you dead to sin? All the pride, all the bitterness, all the hatred. Or oh, you're fooling yourself. I make it simple. We probably have people on the live stream. How many people on the live stream today really couldn't be in the house of God? I mean, you're sick. You're bedridden. You didn't have money for passage. You didn't have money on the phone to call and ask somebody to pick you up. We've got comfortable and lazy as Christians. We've counted our own glory and the glory of the cross and found that our needs and our desires are more important than what Christ wants for us. And it's time for us as Christians to come back and re-examine ourselves and ask ourselves if we are crucified with Christ or not. He came as a baby in a manger, lived sinless, 
And yet sinless died on our cross for your sins and my sins. Came as a seed of a woman. Went through so much for you and I. And yet still we want to hold on to the little sins that make us feel good. Looking at a fruit like Eve. Looking at sin like Eve. The Bible says in about verse 3 or 4 in Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter 3 that Eve saw the fruit that it was pleasant to the eye. It looked good. We look at things and it looked good and we hold on to it even though we know it wrong. Friends, examine yourselves. Just as Christ came as a seed and died on a cross for you and I, so to examine yourself and see if you are crucified. Die to self that Christ may live in you and you would bring forth much fruit. Almighty God, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come into your house today. And I pray, O oh God, that Father, as we remember the birth of Jesus Christ this month, that Father, we would remember the sacrifice he made also. And examine ourselves that we would find ourselves pleasing unto you. That in this Christmas season, we would go forth and bring forth fruits. Having died to pride, having died to greed, having died to self. That we would go forth and help others. And bring them forth as fruits into your kingdom. That others would come to the knowledge of the love of Jesus Christ. And they would know, O oh God, of the sacrifice he made. Coming, being born as a man, to be crucified as a lamb, that we could be redeemed and they would accept you as their redeemer and the sacrifice you have made for them on the cross. We thank you, O oh God, for redeeming us, for setting us free from the curse of sin and death. Help us to never take that for granted, O oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. What a powerful word this morning. And, you know, a very insightful exegesis of the word of God. Amen. Looking at the seed of the very, very interesting indeed. And remember, this series continues. Next week, you'll hear from Brother Bob as he develops and others, you know, as we go straight up to Christmas. That's why you can't miss a Sunday. Amen? You cannot afford to miss a Sunday service. Amen? Praise the name of the Lord. And you know, we must die. We must die to self. To our own ways. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. At this time we want to, to honor our two candidates who baptized. And we want the parents to come for them. Um, Kezia and her sister Kenesha to collect their certificates. So have your cameras ready to take out some pictures. You know we like these occasions for memory. Amen. And. And we also have a little clipping. I don't know if that is ready at this time. While they are coming up. Okay. Hmm? Yes, right now. Yeah, you all can come now, my time.
the Lord. Hallelujah. So at this time I want Sister Patsy to come and assist. And when she taught the class and um, you know well of course in Kenesha's case uh, Kenesha knew everything so we didn't really have a teacher. Amen. But Kezia went through the class and and so on. So at this time yeah okay so after we give out the certificates and um, what we do is we extend the right hand of fellowship it says here word of faith gospel tabernacle baptism certificates go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father the son and the holy ghost matthew 28 19. this certifies that Cassia, carissa Dominic Gopal, in a desire to follow the Lord, was publicly baptized by complete submi submersion according to scripture on the 26th day of November in the year 2023. Right? And what we do, we extend at uh, the right hand of fellowship, we shake their hands and we greet them as official a baptized member of the church and the same thing we do for Kenesha, Alyssa, Paula, Gopal right baptized on the same day and we well we don't have certificate for Diana and he take a dog one time he he was in the water so he take a double dose amen so at this time we want your Diana you could bring um, well Paula you could bring Kezia I'm up here. So give Kezia a big round of applause. Of God. Amen. So congratulations again and may God richly bless you. Thank you. All right, so we extend the right hand of fellowship. Welcome. God bless. And we have Kenesha to collect her certificate, a baptism certificate. God bless you, yes! God bless you. Right, this is your. Right, so God will bless both of them as a continue to grow in the wisdom and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I have one verse of scripture taken from Romans chapter 8 verse 1. At least you're going to read this for me. Okay, um, Kezia. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, but who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. There is now no condemnation to you, right? In Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. So at this time we congratulate them. After the service you could shake their hands and so on. We want to go on with our, our um, communion service at this time. So we ask Brother Bob and Hans Raj to come up and assist here. Yeah? And when you come for your communion, you can put your offering and so on one time, so we, we handle that aspect one time. Amen? Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 23, it says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped saying, This cup is New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning 
the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So let us be mindful, let us be obedient to God, and partake of the sacraments, that which represents the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You can pray. Almighty God and our Heavenly Father, who art in heaven, and hallowed be your name. Father, we do give praise and thanks unto you, and we bless your holy and your matchless name. We thank you, Father, because you're a holy God, and you say, be ye holy, because I am holy. And Father, we thank you, Father, for who you are. And thank you for choosing us, because we didn't choose you. And loving us first, because we didn't love you. And Father, we thank you, we have the privilege and the opportunity to sup at your table today, Lord. To have fellowship and communion with you, and fellowship and communion one with the other. And Father, I lift this emblem that represents the body of Christ. That was broken for us, my God. That was bruised for us, my God. And Father, I lift it before you with thanksgiving, and we receive it with all thanksgiving. We bless it, we sanctify it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, thank you this morning, God, that you brought us here, my God, each and every soul that is present here. To have fellowship and communion to partake one with the other i know god that when we went to sleep last night father we couldn't say that we will wake up this morning we couldn't say my god that we will yes have a bright and a prosperous day my god because only by your will we are living this morning and we wake up this morning because you permit us and you give us that opportunity and that privilege to live i believe father that when we go in our sleep it is our grave but you have waked us this morning from our grave. And Father, we are ever grateful and thankful unto you who loves us so much, my God, that you gave your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die on that cross, that we could live and we could live eternally. We could have life and have it more abundantly through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, thank you for this opportunity that we have, the privilege we have. I pray this morning, as your words say, we will present ourselves a living sacrifice this morning, holy and acceptable unto you, which is our reasonable service. That Father, as we partake as one body, we'll do it, my God, according to your word, my God, that we'll be worthy this morning to partake. I pray that if we have sinned, we have fallen short of your glory in any way, that you will have mercy and forgive us this morning. Wash us and cleanse us with that precious blood of your son, Jesus Christ. And make us whole and make us well this morning, my God, that as we partake, we'll be conscious, my God, that we are partaking as one body, as one member in the body of Christ, in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you this morning, Father, for everything that is said and done in this service. Amen. Eternal God and Heavenly Father, we lift this element into your hands, O oh dear God, in remembrance of what you have done on the cross of Calvary for us, O oh dear God. Thank you, O oh God, for loving us so much that you give up heaven for us, O oh dear God, and allowing your body to be bruised, that ours may be whole, O oh dear God. Father, thank you, O oh God, for your resurrection life upon our life, O oh dear God. Father, thank you, O oh God, for your gift of grace upon our life, O oh dear God. Thank you, O oh God, Father, that no sickness form against us, O oh dear God, can live in our body, O oh dear God. Father, the same power that lives in you and raised you from the grave, same power lives within us, O oh dear God, Father. We, we claim no sickness, oh dear, no sickness, no bad health, O oh dear God, upon our life, O oh dear God. Father, by your stripe we are healed, O oh dear God, as we partake in Holy Communion this morning, O oh dear God. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. As they put the sacrament there, you can come and take your portion, go back to your seats. You could put your offering and tithes at the same time. And we'll partake together normally.
given thanks he break it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance after me let's partake together let's go. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had subsumed. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us part it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for healing. Thank you for deliverance. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins, our iniquities. Thank you for touching us and making us turn of the Most High God. We thank you for healing us in every dimension of our life, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, in every area of our life. We speak healing right now. Cancer gone. Tumors disappear. Sugar diabetes gone. Sugar level back to normal. Pressure level back to normal. Every sickness and disease gone. And even those that are viewing online, we speak healing. Because there is no distance in prayer. For with your stripes, we are healed. Touch your people, my God. Even that one that is tuning in right now. That is having that struggle and that challenge with health. I speak healing to you. I speak healing to you. That one that is viewing right now. I speak healing from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Healing in relationships as well. In the home, let there be love and joy and peace and unity and understanding and obedience. Every area of our life, let there be healing. And I thank you for doing it. I thank you for doing it. Touch your people. And she's...